Good morning, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to go through topic 10, which is shear and link moving diagrams using graphical method and area method. Remember that last time we drew the shear diagram and bending moving diagram using functions. And we derived some important relationship between the moment and the shear and the, the loads. For example, if you took the derivative of the moment, you will find the shear. If you took the derivative of the shear, you will find the load. So you were able to derive all, those, all these functions last time, and they were important so that we will today take another method, area method, which, which actually it's, it's a very quick method. Like it doesn't take time, unlike the one that we had last time. But the thing is, to be able to explain this method, we, have, we had to explain all the uh, moment and shear functions. So let's go ahead and, and get started with, for example, this problem. If I do have a load, a beam and load in the middle of 10 kilonewton. But before going through this problem, I just want to remind you again, whenever we draw a beam like this, whenever we draw this line beam, this represents a 3D beam like this. For example, it can be rectangle, it can be square, it can be circular, but it does represent something in 3D. But instead of every time drawing the 3D, we can draw it like as a line. So this line represents a beam. And if we have this 10 kilonewton, this 10 kilonewton, if we had this 10 kilonewton here, and this beam, is supported from both sides and I applied this 10 kilonewton in the middle, it's gonna bend like this, right? So which axis that this beam gonna bend about? So if we look, this beam gonna bend about x axis because x axis passes here. So this is x, this is z, and the vertical is y. So if this beam gonna bend due to this 10 kilonewton, the beam going to bend like this, right? Which means it's bending about the x-axis. So from now on, whenever we have this 2D problem, so we don't draw the 3D, we always draw like this 2D problem, you know that this beam is rotating about the x-axis. From now on, this will be our default, okay? So let's go ahead and draw the shear diagram for this beam. Okay, so we have this method where we can start from right or left, okay? And let me remind you of the sign convention for the shear. So if I do have a beam like this, so the positive sign convention, which I want you to memorize, and of course the opposite to that is negative, but like I want you to memorize the positive, so the positive is, if you do have a beam like this, anything, anything from the right of the beam goes up and anything from the left goes down, that's the positive sign convention. So let me show you why. So the sign convention tells you, so the shear that will cause the beam to rotate clockwise that's the positive shear. So clockwise forces, that's the positive shear. So now remember this and let's apply this and drawing the shear force diagram. So I do have this beam and I did make the region here at the beginning, which is at the support and at the end and at the load in the middle. I want you to, to first of all, start from either right or left. So let's, let's always start from the left side and I will show in a moment how we're going to work from the right. So if I told you what is the shear at the very first point, so what would you do? You'll put your hand like this and just make your hand move. So as I put my hand here at the very beginning, I do have a five kilonewton. And from the very beginning, I have five kilonewton, which is a concentrated shear. So you will go up by five. So this, if I started from left to right, left to right, anything goes up is positive and anything will go down is negative. That's why it's easy if you always start from left to right. So I go up by positive five, 
I'll put my hand like this and I'll make my hand move from left to right. By saying putting my hand, that means I don't, I don't see anything from the right. I only see whatever my hand passes through, so I only see this part. So I put my hand here. I only see the five. So that's why I drew the five. My hand doesn't see anything, so the five will go constant until my hand see the 10. Once I pass the 10, the 10 now is looking down. So whatever goes up is positive, whatever goes down is negative. So now at this point, it's gonna be constant until I reach the 10, then I will go down by the 10. So positive five minus 10 is equal to negative five. That's why my calculation should be something like this, positive five and then minus 10, which is negative five at this point. Point, for example, let me put it up there. So this point, let me call it, for example, A. So shear V at point A is equal to five minus 10 is equal to negative five. So I'll go constant until I reach point A, then I will go down by 10. So when I go down by 10, I, re I, I reach negative five. Then the reason why I went constant, because I kept moving my hand, I don't see any forces, that's why I kept moving constant until I passed to like, now five is looking up, so minus five plus five, that's why it closes at the end. So now this will be the shear force diagram, negative, positive. So some of you might ask, okay, why, what should I, I mean, like, what if I started from the right side? So from the right side, the rule that anything goes up is positive, anything goes down is negative doesn't work because now I'm working from here. So from here, anything goes down should be positive, not, not like anything goes up. So that's why it's easy to start from the left. So your mind is programmed that anything goes up is positive, anything goes down is negative. But if you are from the right side, anything goes down is positive. So now I'm starting from the right side and I'm moving my hand I have five, so five I'll not go up, I'll go down. That's why I had negative until I see 10, but 10 is down, that's why it's negative five plus 10, so I have positive five. That's how the shear diagram, we form the shear diagram, okay? So now let's draw the bending moment and using our understanding of the previous lesson, we already said that, that dm, let me put it here, you know that if we took the derivative of the moment, we're gonna get the shear, right? So let me put the dx up. So dm is equal to v dx. So whenever you see d, that means you want to take the integration. So let me take the integration of dm and integration v dx, okay? So let, let's now put the limits of the integration. So let's say I want to find the integration, or I want to find the moment at that point, okay, at point A. So I will let you now, I will tell you now in a moment why, but let me name this point B. So I want to find the moment, or like let me put the integration limits from B to A, which is from the start from B to A, and also the shear is from B to A, okay? So the integration of V dx, that means summing the area under the shear, under the V function. So from B to A, so from B to A, if I sum this area, what I'm going to get, I'm going to get the M, so the integration of dM, it's M, so integration of nothing dM, that's M, and then the limits here is B to A. So MA, which equal to ma minus mb, here is equal, equal. So the integration of v, that's the area under the shear diagram from b to a, okay? So if I f wanna find the difference in the moment, and I will show you now in the moment why, in a moment now why, so this difference is the area under the shear. In different words, if I want to find the difference between MA and MB, so this will be the area under this part, under this shear function, or under the shear diagram. 
So let me start by drawing the shear diagram, sorry, the moment diagram. So at the beginning, at the very first point, the moment here equal to zero, and the reason why is I don't have any concentrated moment here. So if I don't have any concentrated moment at the ends, that means the moment at the end will be zero. So at the end here, I do have zero. So that's zero. So now MA, let me now put like the calculations. So I'll put the calculations. So MA, sorry, MB, which is at the very first point, is equal to zero. Now I want to find the moment at point A. So MA, which is in the middle here, is going to be the area under the shear. So MA, which is here, you want to sum all the area. So now the area here is 5 times 2 meters. And the 5 times 2 meters, that's the shear diagram, which was a rectangle, which is equal to 10 kilonewton meter okay so at the middle here I do have a moment is equal to 10 kilonewton meter so I have a start of zero I have a middle 10 so I'll make a line between them like this and here this is what the integration tells you which is m a minus m b which is this difference so this difference here which is what you see here is the area under the shear diagram okay so now let's continue so now I named the very first point B this point in the middle a let's name this C and now I want to find the M at C so what should you do you will also continue summing the area under the shear diagram but remember first of all this method of summing the area only only works from left to right so I don't want anyone start summing the area from right to left. No, you always have to start from left to right. And if I want to find the moment at a point, you need to sum all the areas from the left. So what I want to do now, I want to sum the area from the left. So I do have from the beginning 5 times 2, which is the rectangle, the positive rectangle. And then I do have a negative rectangle, which is 5 also times 2. But since the area here is negative, so what I want to do is minus 5 times 2, which is obviously equal to 0. That's why at the end I have 0, then I'll make a line here connecting to a 0. So the whole moment is positive. Okay? So you don't always have to, for example, the next point here, you don't have to always sum all the area previously. What you have to do, MA here, which is at the middle, that represents the area before that point, right? So what you want to do at C, you want to say MC is equal to MA and then add this additional area or just add everything. It's the same thing, okay? So there is another concept that I need to explain here, which is what does that mean that the moment is positive? Okay, so now... Okay, first of all, I need to tell you that the moment that I drew here, it is according to the U.S. Convention, United States Convention. I mean, elsewhere in the world, we will draw this moment flipped, okay? So the positive in the United States is up, positive in elsewhere is down. But here, we will only do it up like this. But I'm telling you in case you are working with someone from a different country, okay? So the moment here positive means if you do have a beam and I apply 10 kilonewton in the middle, it's going to bend like this, or it's going to deflect like this. Here, we draw the bending moment opposite to the deflection. Okay? So you imagine how this beam deflects, then you draw the bending moment opposite to it. So in another word, if I do have a beam like this, and I drew two lines, so here is a beam before applying anything, I drew a line above and a line below. When I apply a load, what you see here that the bottom line or the bottom part of the beam elongated and the above part of the beam shortened. And if it's shortened, that means it's compression or it's compressed and the bottom part it's elongating, so it's tension. 
So it's also another thing that you need to, to, to also um, think of the moment is that we draw the moment in the compression side. So remember, this line represents, let me here. So this line represents a 2 dB, like a 3 dB, right? When I, tell, when I draw the moment up, that means the upper side of the beam is in compression because we draw the moment in compression. As what I showed you now, if I have a load 10, it's going to make the beam deflect like this. If it deflects like this, means the upper side is in compression, the lower side is in tension. So we draw the bending moment up means the upper side of the beam is compression and the lower side of the beam in tension. What, um, what is in the middle? Because I said the upper side in compression, so let me draw the 3D. So this is, for example, the 3D of the beam. Of course, when you draw the bending moment diagram, don't draw the 3D. This is just for explanation purposes. Once you draw the positive beam, sorry, positive bending moment, so that's enough for the bending moment. What I'm drawing now is just for the purpose of explanation. So you do have a beam. So the beam is divided in the middle by something we call neutral axis. And I'm going to explain this in the next two lessons, I think, in, next, in the next two weeks. So I do have in the middle line, it's like a plane, a plane that's in the middle here, that if I bend the beam, there is a plane that is neither tense, like tensioned or compressed that we call the neutral axis. So this is like, think of it as a plane that in the middle here, like a plane in the middle, it's, it's neither compressed nor tensioned. So if I drew the bending moment like this upside, that means the upper side of the beam here is compressed. I'll write compression also here. And the lower side of the beam, of course, it's going to be tension. OK? And here as well. OK, one more thing. So this is in the 2D. So first of all, when we have a load, we drew the bending moment. And then this is the bending moment. And at any point in the beam here, any point in the beam, you can read the bending moment from the diagram that you drew. We are interested always in the maximum positive and the maximum negative. But now in this diagram, we only have positive. If I want to draw this in a cross-section level, what I want to do, I want to take a cross-section here where I do have the maximum bending moment. So in the middle here, which is this one, where I do have this section, I do have a maximum. How I want to draw this? I want to draw a cross section. And then if I do have a bending moment that is positive like this, I want to represent it that way. So at, at the middle, the moment is 10. So I'll make a line here. And I'll make an arrow. And I'll tell you why I drew the arrow in the up in the moment. M moment is equal to 10 kilonewton meter. This section is that section. And now here we have the moment is positive, which is the upper side is in compression, and the, and the compression is what the arrow represents. If we draw the arrow up, that means the upper side of the beam is compression. If we draw the arrow down, that means the lower side of the beam is compression. So the arrow indicates where is the tension and compression. So here is the moment, and then at the middle here is the x-axis. So I will draw the x-axis. And here I have negative, negative, which also indicates that the upper side of the beam is in compression because the arrow here represents compression and also indicates where the compression is. And the lower side is in tension. OK? And here is the value of the bending moment. OK? So let's now move to another problem. So just what, what we're going to do now is just practice on the concept that I explained now. So I do have a shear force, so I, so I do have a shear force diagram. I do have all these kind of loads. So let's practice what we said. 
So I will start from left to right because my mind is programmed. Anything goes up is positive. Anything goes down is negative. I have two goes up here. So I'll go up by two. My hand moves. I don't see anything. That's why I'll move constant. So in my calculator, I will do have, I'll put plus two and then constant. Then I see 10, minus 10 because it looks down. Then in my calculator, I have two. Then I'll add minus 10. That's, that's, I will have an eight here, a negative eight, then I will move. The concentrated moment will not affect the shear diagram. So it doesn't go up or down. So that's why it's not gonna be counted in the shear diagram because it's a bending moment. And then it's gonna be constant here until I see 20. So in my calculator, I had minus two, sorry, plus two, minus 10, then plus 20. So I will go up to positive 12 and then I will go here once I pass the 12, so the 12 close. If in my calculation, I went here and I end up with a number that's different than 12, that means I did something wrong. Also at this point, the six kilonewton not gonna affect the shear diagram because again, it's not a force that's parallel to the cross section. This is the force that's caused tension or compression. So this will only be in the axial force diagram. We don't have here axial, but I would put that in axial. This force and this moment will not affect the shear force diagram. So let's now draw the shear diagram. So I'll, I'll go up by two and then I'll move constant until I see the 10. So two, positive two, minus 10, I have minus eight. Then I will move constant until 20. So in my calculator, plus two, minus eight, plus 20, so that's 12. And as you can, Try your best just to show that the eight should be higher than two. I mean like try to draw at least to scale or a reasonable scale, which is show that the two here is smaller than the eight, smaller than the 12. So the 12 should be like the highest one or like the longest one because as if you are drawing a plot. So just to give you a sense to which one, where is the maximum shear for example. Okay, so this will be the shear diagram. Let's now draw the bending moment diagram. So to draw the diagram, don't look at the question. Use only the shear diagram to draw the bending moment diagram. So I will start summing the areas and the areas that I'm going to sum, again, from left to right. I don't want anyone to start from the right to the left. So let's just name some values here. Sorry, say name some points. So let's name this point, for example. I will name this point A, this point B, this one C, and D. So MA, moment at A. So moment at A, do I have any concentrated moment here? I don't. So MA gonna be zero. That's why I will start here with zero. Next point, which is point B, this point. So MB is summing the area to the left. So I only have a rectangle of two times two, that's square. So two times two, and it's a positive, which is equal to four, that's kilonewton meter. That's why at point B, I do have a four. So I'll make a line like this, a straight line, that's not a curve, okay? Now, I will move to, let me put this point, let me call it M. So whenever you see a concentrated moment, it's not gonna be detected in the shear, but you have to, whenever you see the bending moment, you need to calculate the bending moment twice, once, before the concentrated moment, once you, before you see it, and once after, so before and after. So moment at M here, I wanna make, I wanna see M, moment at M, I will write B, which means before. So let me write it that way, B, E, F, which is before. So what do I have? So moment at M, I wanna calculate all the areas from the left. So what you can do, you can either say two times two minus eight times three, 
or 2 times 2 is already mb, right? So mm is equal to mb, which is 4, which is the area of that part, then minus this area, which is minus 8 times 3. So 4 minus 8 times 3, I do have minus 20. So I will go down at m to minus 20. Okay, now I do have m moment at m, now after. So only remember, the before and after when you have a concentrated bending moment. So at the concentrated bending moment, I do have m before and m after. So let me tell you something. Whenever you see the bending moment looking that way, I want you to always adjust this bending moment to look or to warp towards the direction that you're working at. Now we're working from left to right. So I want to make this bending moment, and instead of it's looking like this, looking that way, I want to just adjust it. I'm not changing the moment, so the moment is still clockwise. So I'm going to make it like this. So it's still clockwise and 20. Okay? And I'll tell you now in a moment. And still the point of application is here. Okay? So... The reason why I do have a moment looking up that way, if you remember the sign convention of the moment, the moment that will is looking like this, that is positive. So since we are working from the left here, so the arrow that looks up or the arrow that points up, that's the positive. And we did have a bending moment that's negative here, which is negative 20. That's why I will know that the moment at m after you can either start summing all this area before or you can take the moment that you already calculated so not minus 20 here represent all this area so you will say minus 20 then plus 20 I'm, i didn't plus 20 because this bending moment is positive the arrow looks up and the arrow here is look up, so, and that's the sign convention of the bending moment. That's why m after now is equal to 0. That's why I will go up here to 0. Notice that the concentrated shear here causes a drop in the shear, but didn't cause a drop in the moment. What causes a drop in a moment is a concentrated moment. So concentrated moment causes a drop in the moment, but doesn't cause a drop in the shear. Okay? So now let's now continue. So that's MM after. So let's do MC. Moment at C. So moment at C, what I want to do, I want to sum all these areas. But what I did, that moment at M after, it's already summed all this area at this point and took the 20 concentrated bending moment into account. So what is missing now is zero, which is this, which this zero represents everything before that, minus this area. So what I will say is zero minus eight times three, minus 24 kilonewton meter. So at this, at point C, I do have a 24, and that's why I went that way. Okay? Now, the 6 kilonewton not going to affect the moment because that's an axial force. So the axial force will not affect the moment. The axial force only affects the axial force diagram. If, you're, you, do, if you don't believe me, we can have this point. Okay, let's do it. It's not, not going to hurt. So let me call this point N. So moment at N is equal to all the summation of all these areas and since I already have minus 24 and minus 24 is at C which is the summation of all this area so I will say minus 24 the moment plus 12 times 1 which is equal to 12 negative 12 so here I will put 12 And then 
MD at the last point, you can either notice that I don't have concentrated bending moment here, so I should, I can put zero, or you can continue calculating by taking the 12 minus 12 times the missing area, which is 12 times one, positive. It's not times, it's plus, which is equal to zero. The reason why I told you it doesn't matter because this is still gonna be a straight line. So if you make the straight line like this, this point is still gonna be 12. If you wanna, for example, if you draw to scale, you're gonna measure it. But it's okay, it doesn't hurt to calculate it. So now let's also understand the meaning of this bending moment. Let me take this bending moment away. So I will take this bending moment. And let's just draw the 3D of the beam on it. So I do have Okay, so if I drew the bending moment, the calculation showed me the bending moment until here, until that point. So let me draw a line here, just an imaginary line. So it tells me at this part of the beam, it's in compression because you draw the bending moment up in here. So up in here means the upper side of, any of the beam in this portion is compression, so the lower side is in tension. Okay, and now we also drew the bending moment in this side down, which means this side is in compression and the upper side here is in tension. And the reason why it's important to know where is the tension and compression parts or the portions in the beam is in structural engineering application in reinforced concrete or in concrete, in concrete, concrete is strong in compression, but it's very weak in tension. That's why we put steel rebars in the concrete. But the thing is, we believe that the concrete is very strong to resist the, this compression side or this compression moment or this part that's compressed due to moment. And in the tension, it cannot support that. That's why we need to know where is the tension parts so that we can put the enforcement like this, for example. I will show you a picture in a moment. So here I put reinforcement and here we're gonna put reinforcement, okay? For example, here for example, this is, this is the, b before we cast concrete, we just put the steel rebars like this. In locations, for example, if you went to any construction site and you found a beam where there is, for example, in certain portions, either up or down, there is very dense or very like a uh, huge amount of steel. That's when you know like this portion is in tension. That, that's the application, for example, in, in reinforced concrete. Um, this is the beam and you can find like the steel coming out of it. So this concrete is cast on steel rebars and the way we put like the amount of rebars it's where we have more tension okay so that's for example for this problem example let's now to move to distributed load so if we do have a distributed load so i have a distributed load of w so the reaction is going to be wl over 2 wl over 2 so now let's draw the shear force diagram so shear force diagram Again, from the very first beginning here, the shear is WL over 2. So I'll go up by WL over 2. And something I forgot to mention, that whenever you see a distributed load, you want to convert it to a point load. So I want to convert it to a point load, but instead of drawing it, um, like a solid line, I'll draw it a dotted line so that you can differentiate between this and the point load. So this is WL. Okay, so let me tell you something. If we didn't have a distributed load and instead we have this point load, what would you do? Like the previous example, 
and I'll draw it in orange because that's like that's 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 incorrect. So I will make a line here that represents that region. So if I did have a point load and instead of the W, and this point load gonna be W times L, I will go constant until I see the WL, then half WL, so positive that positive half WL because this is a positive side. half WL minus WL, so that's minus WL over two, which is half. So when you subtract half something minus the whole thing, you will have the half, right? So you will go down and then you will close the diagram here. And here you have a value of WL over two, but in an opposite sign. Okay, but this is incorrect because we don't have a point load. We have a distributed load and distributed load means that we had W, which is, for example, it is 10 kilonewton per meter, which means every meter here we have a kilonewton. So we have a lot of point loads that we represented as a distributed load, which is, for example, if this, if this room that I'm here is full with students, that's a lot of point load. That's why we don't represent it as a point load when we design this lab. We instead put like an area load or like a distributed load because we can put all this point load. So from the very beginning here, we do have a shear. So we do have like a concentrated point loads. So from the very beginning, we will start go down because we have WL over two minus this value. Then we move to right minus that value and so on. That's why we will have this line. So it's a decreasing line and you can have this decreasing line between this uh, rectangle or this rectangle can be like a, a working line and you can erase it, for example. This is not the shear and linear line, that's our shear. And if you remember from the last lecture, if we do have a distributed load, which is, for example, a constant, if we took the integration of the, sh of the load, we have the shear, right? So when we, when we integrate a constant, we end up, for example, if we integrate, if we integrate for example, 2 dx, we're going to end up with 2x. So x here is like an increasing or decreasing line. That's why we have a shear of increasing or decreasing, right? Also, if we took an integration of the shear, because that, that's, the, that's the function what we did last time. If we integrate the load, we're gonna get the shear. If we integrated the shear, we're gonna get the moment. And if we wanna go backwards, we will take the derivative. So now let's do the bending moment. So here is the bending moment. So from the very, from the very first beginning, we do have zero because we don't have any concentra concentrated moment at the beginning. So at the beginning and the end, we are confident that it's a zero. So now let's find the moment at the point in the middle, which is simply just adding this area. So I wanna say this point A, so MA is equal to, again, MA is summing all the area from the left. So half base, which is L over two, if the whole beam is L, so half of it is L over two, right? And the reason why the zero shear here happened in the middle, because the triangle here started with WL over two and ended with WL over two. That's why the point of the zero shear gonna be in the middle. If this is larger than that one, then this one gonna be shifted, okay? So half base times height, the height is WL over two. What I will get is WL square over eight. And this is a magic number that you need to memorize for the distributed load. So in distributed load, if I do have, so you first need to figure out the beginning of the moment at the beginning of distributed load, which is this point, And the, at the end of distributed load, which is that point, make just a dotted line between them, which is in this case aligns with the beam. And from the middle here, we will go up 
by W L square over eight, which is also what the summation of area here gives me. So here I do have W L square over eight, and in the bending moment I do have a parabola. Okay, and again, this is the American moment convention. Elsewhere we will draw it down. Okay, so at the middle here we have a W L square over eight, which is this amount. Okay, and also if we want to figure out where is the tension and compression parts, the upper side here is going to be compression, the lower side is in tension. So let's do something, I forgot to do it here. For example, if I want to design this beam, I will take the maximum positive part and the maximum negative, which is here. And let me draw it down in terms of, let me draw it here. And in the next couple lessons, we're going to take it from this drawing. So for example, at B, so this is section at B, so the moment is positive and so the compression is up, so I will draw a line here that like represent the moment, I'll put the arrow up, so the moment here is equal to 4 and here I do have the x-axis or the neutral axis that divides the tension and compression, the upper side is negative, the lower side is positive, which is upper side in compression, lower side is in tension. So that's at B. At C though, the cross section is like this, and the moment now, and it's because the moment is down, the compression is down, so I'll put the arrow down. So here the arrow down, so M is equal to 24, and I still do have the X axis, or the bending axis now, and it's the neutral axis as well. And what I do have, the lower side now is in compression, the upper side is in tension. Okay? Same here as well. At A, the beam, I'm going to put the arrow up. M is equal to WL square over 8. And the upper side is in compression, the lower side is in tension. Okay, so now let's take an example where we do have a distributed load. So we should be quick now. So from the beginning, I do have a shear of 16.5 constant, then minus 5, so plus 16.5 minus 5, so I'll go down here, and then I'll move constant. Okay, so let's stop here and I'll tell you what, what we're going to do. But at the beginning, let's convert this distributed load to a point load. And when we convert the distributed load to a point load, I want you to make it as a dotted line like this to differentiate between a point load, which is a solid, and a distributed load. So 10 times 5 here is 50. kilonewton. So I will go up by 16.5, and I'll move constant until the 5 kilonewton, and then 16.5 minus 5, that's 11.5. So I'll go down to 11.5, and then I'll move constant, and that's the beginning of the distributed load. Okay? So what should we do? 11.5, and just remember this. If I, if I did have a point load instead of a distributed load, I will move constant until I see the 50, then I will go down from 11.5 to like 11.5 minus 50. I do have 38.5. So I'll go down to 38.5 and I'll move it like this and then I will close the diagram. And I found that I ended up with 38.5 here. So now I, I, my calculation is correct. But now I can't make a solid line here because this is not a, uh, a point load, this is a distributed load. So instead, between these dotted lines, I will draw the, I will draw the, the line, which is like the, the, the shear diagram. So now let me put it that way.
okay? I do have the beginning, I do have the end, then I'll make a line in here. So now you can erase this uh, working lines. Okay, and that's the sheet diagram. And notice here that I see that I, I see um, a zero shear. So that's where I need to like initiate a region here because I know there will be a maximum bending moment here. Okay, so now let's start drawing the bending moment diagram. So what I will do, let me name all these points. So A, B, C, D, E. Okay, let's start with MA. So moment at A is equal to zero because I don't have any concentrated moment. MB is equal to, so moment at B here, I want to sum all the area before that. So I have 16.5 times 2. So I will say 16.5 times 2 because that's the rectangle, the shear, which will equal to 33. So at B, I do have a 33 kilonewton meter. So instead here, the moment is kilonewton meter. So I will go up to 33, okay? Now at C, you wanna sum all the area before C, but the, this 33 represent that part. So I will write 33 plus 11.5 times three meters. And now I ended up with 67.5. So here I do have 67.5 and let me make a line here. Okay. So here is the thing. So at the beginning of the distributed load, I do have 67.5. At the end, I do have E, which is at, at ME because I don't have any concentrated moment here. So it's going to be zero. There is two ways. So... Let me, let me draw, let me continue first with the summation of area method and later I will show you the other way. So M at D, I want to find, I want to sum all the area before it. I did all this and because they represented by the 67.5 and then I need to add this very small triangle. So that means I need to find where the shear hit the zero. So this is the X. So what I will do, I will do the slope is equal to rise over run. There is a lot of methods to find this x, and I will choose that one because the slope of the shear is the load. So I do have slope is equal to 10. The rise is equal to 11.5. The run is x. So x is equal to 11.5 over 10, which is 1.15. So x here is equal to 1.15. Now, if I want to add this area, so I will say 67.5, which is this, uh, this guy, which represents the summation of the area before that point, then I'll add that small area, plus half base times height. So this will equal to 74.1. Okay, so here, 74.1. So I know that, let me draw a working line here, dotted because I'm gonna delete them, and then I do have working lines here. So now, because this is a parabola, so I need to figure out, at that point, should I, should I have a positive slope or a negative slope, which will also tell me whether I'm gonna concave up I'm gonna con like how I'm gonna concave up or down, and how we wanna do that. If you remember from the previous lesson, or from calculus, for example, if I want to find the slope at a point, I will take the derivative of that function and I will substitute in the derivative at that point. If it's positive, that means my slope is positive. If it's negative, my slope is negative. But we we already did that. So the slope of the bending moment, or the the derivative of the bending moment is the shear. And when we substitute at x equal this distance, we have that shear. And that shear is positive 11.5. And here, we have a positive shear or positive slope. And the slope is decreasing, but still positive. 
So we have a big slope, and the slope going to decrease until we have zero here, which means we don't have any slope, it's just flat. That means it's going to concave up, like it's going to look down, sorry. So it's going to be like this. Because the slope increase, the, the, the slope starts big, then the tangent decrease, decrease, decrease until we have zero. That's why it's going to end like this. Okay, and starting from here, if I want to find whether my slope is going to be positive or negative, again, the slope here is negative because I ha do have a negative, and for example, zero, then start to increase. So the slope is zero, then the slope is negative, and it starts to decrease. That's why also I will do have... the slope like this, or sorry, the, the, it's going to concave like this. So that's the bending moment diagram. Another way to figure out this is if I do have the load, the distributed load looks down, so it's going to concave down. That's why I do have, I did have a load that looks down, that's a distributed load that looks down, that's gravity, that's why the, the curve looks down. And also here, it looks down, that's why it concaves down. If I did have a load that looks up, then the bending moment is going to concave up. That's another way. That's my mathematical way, and that's the shortcut way. And finally, let's do this problem, which is in the booklet. And now it's going to be easy. So the shear diagram, I'll start from the left. I'll go up to 20. I'll move constant, and then 20 minus 50, I do have a 30, then I go down by 50, 230, and then I will close here. And I ended up with 30, which tells me that I'm, I'm, I'm right. Okay, bending moment, let me po make a point. I do have A, B, C. So M at A is going to be equal to zero because I don't have any concentrated moment. M at B is summing the rectangle area, which is 20 times 10, which is this area, which is equal to 200, positive. So I'll go up to 200. And then I will end up, so at C, it's not zero because I do have a concentrated moment. And from the, if, if you remember the sign convention, if I do have a beam like this, and if the arrow points up, it's going to be positive. And if I do have a beam like this and the arrow points down, that's negative, right? And if you notice, this one matches that one. So I should end up with negative. If you didn't notice this, it's OK. Let's, let's do the MC. So the MC is equal to. 20 times 10, which is this first area. So I want to sum all this area, basically. And I already did sum this area by representing it with 200. So 200 minus 30 times 10, which is 200 minus 300 is equal to negative 100, which is at this point, I'll go down by not 200, it is 100. And then I'll make a line between them. Okay, that's positive and that's negative. So that's, that's one way to look into this. And the question still asks us one more thing. Okay, what is the internal shear at x equal to? So here, the origin they draw as the origin start from here. So at x equal to, which is somewhere here, because the whole thing is 10 here, so somewhere here. So the shear at x equal to is 20. Shear at x equal 18, which is going to be somewhere here, it's going to be 30, OK? And also ask us, what is the bending moment at the x equal 10? So at 10, which is here, the bending moment is going to be 200. And if we want to find the moment at x equal 15, so at x equal 15, which is going to be somewhere in the middle, like I don't know where, but let's first find where is the moment going to be zero at, OK? So this is now not going to be slope equal rise over run because we don't have a distributed load. But what should you do now is you will do similar triangle, OK? 
find where is the zero shear, sorry, zero moment, and then from there you can find the 15, because 15, is it before the zero moment or it's after? So that's how you will know which triangle you're gonna work and do the similar triangle, okay? So now let's do the other, like another method. So this other method doesn't depend on the shear diagram. So the disadvantage of the previous method that we need to have a shear diagram to draw the bending moment. But this method, we don't need to have the shear diagram to draw the bending moment. So I just erased the bending moment now, sorry, the shear diagram, and then we will draw the bending moment using that method. So that method, we can start from right or the left, and it depends on, on like calculating the force times the distance. So for example, we know at the very beginning here, the moment is equal to zero because we don't have any concentrated moments here. But in the middle, so in the middle here, we want to calculate, we don't need to calculate the moment at all these points. We need to calculate the moment, for example, whenever we see any change or any load discontinuity, okay? So in the middle here, I will draw a very small, so very small curve. And this curve, the reason why I drew it that way, because now I'm working from left to right, right? So if I'm working from left to right, at that point, now in the middle here, I will draw a very small curve, which represent the moment and would represent the five times two. So if I want to find the moment at that point, from the left, I don't see anything from the right, I will have five times two. So five times two, how is it gonna rotate about that point? It's gonna rotate clockwise, right? So now, first of all, the first step, you'll draw the curve that's warping toward the direction you're working at, and then make the arrow. So the moment here is equal to five times 10. And the reason why we drew it that way, because this will tell us where to draw the bending moment. So five times 10 is equal, sorry, five times two, that's the bending of the moment, which is force times distance is equal to 10. And the arrow looks up. So if the arrow looks up, that means I'm drawing the moment up. So I start with zero to 10. You can either put the bending moment here zero and make a line or continue calculating the bending moment or this method. So I wanna calculate the moment here. So I will make, first of all, I'm working from left to right. That's why I'm, I'm drawing the curve that's warping toward that direction. But I do have two forces, which is the five and the 10. So I will draw two curves. The first curve here is for the effect of five times that distance, which is five times four is equal to 20. And how it's gonna rotate the five around that point. So the five gonna rotate clockwise, right? So that's why I'll draw the arrow here up. And then I do have this curve, which is for this 10. So 10 times two, that's how it's gonna rotate about that point. It's rotating counterclockwise. So I'm gonna draw the arrow down. So this is 10 times two is equal to 20. So now at that point, you have a clockwise moment equal to 20 and counterclockwise moment is equal to 20. So what is the resultant of them? Is zero. That's why at this point, I'm just gonna connect it to zero. And we'll have a positive bending moment here, okay? I'm just redoing all the examples, just like using both methods. So now you, you should be confident with the both method, or like you can use both method in, 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 in solving. So I didn't mention how we can use this method from right to left, I only use it from left to right. But in the next example, I will show you how we can use it in both ways. So from the very beginning, I do have a zero moment because I don't have any concentrated moment here. So I will start with zero. And then next point here, I wanna take the moment. So from the left, I don't see any forces but the two. So the six gonna not gonna contribute. So because there is no any distance to multiply the six with, right? So here, I, okay. And also like draw it a very small curve to differentiate between the curves that you are working, like this is a working curve, which means this is a calculation and the real problem, okay? So I do have 
at that point, I do have two gonna rotate clockwise around this point, right? So it's gonna cause a moment of two times two and the curve points up, which indicates clockwise, four. So I'll go up here by four, I'll make a line, four kilonewton meters, okay? Next point, which is the concentrated bending moment. So again, whenever you see concentrated bending moment, we calculate before and after, okay? So before, before means before we see this bending moment. And let's, let's, let's put it, and okay, let's, let's calculate before first. So before means I don't see the bending moment. So I will do have, I do have two curves, but in, I mean like, let me draw two curves, which is first curve here is due to this two kilonewton rotating about that point or causing a bending moment about that point, which is two times five, which is four times distance, 10, right? And then I do have this 10 rotating counterclockwise. So I'll make a curve here, 10 times three equals 30, and it looks down. So what is the resultant? So the resultant of both of them, let me put it up here. The, result, the resultant of both of them now is equal to, so resultant of 10 clockwise and 30 counterclockwise is 20 counterclockwise, right? As if I'm, not as if, like I'm now subtracting this with this. So 10 minus 30 is minus 20 and the curve gonna look down because the 30 is larger than that. So if the curve look down, that means the bending moment is 20. And I'll make a line between them like this. Okay? Now, I calculated before the point. Now after the point. Now after the point means I see the moment. But since I'm working from left to right, I want to adjust this to warp towards the direction that I'm working at. So I'm gonna continue rotating it. So I'm not changing the bending moment. The bending moment is still clockwise. So I did have from before 20 counterclockwise, which is this guy. And then now I do have the 20, which is that guy. But I'm just like adjusting it. So 20, the resultant of both of them now is zero. That's why I will go up to zero. And now I see the drop in the moment due to concentrated bending moment. Now I want to continue calculating the moment at that point. But now let's work from right to left. And the reason why, because the calculation from right to left, it's going to be easy. So let's start now from right to left. I do have at the beginning zero because I don't have any concentrated moment. At this point, let me cal put the curve that looks toward the direction that I'm working at. Now I'm working from left to right, sorry, right to left. That's why I'm putting the curve pointing toward that direction or warping toward that direction. And now I do have 12. It's gonna cause a bending moment clockwise around that point. So that's why 12 times one, which is equal to 12 and the arrow here looks down means I'm drawing it down. So I have 12 and I'll make a line like this. Okay. At that point, the next point, I still have this 12. I don't see any other forces. So I'll do have 12 times two and it's going to rotate clockwise equal to 24. And the curve here looks down. The arrow looks down. That means I want to draw it down. 24. And when I calculated from the left here, I stopped at that point and from the right, I'm here. So I can make a line between them. Okay, connect to the, the line to the last point you stopped from the left. I don't want you to make the line here, no. The line should be connected to that point because that's the last point, which is the moment after the concentrated bending moment, okay? So now let's apply this method on distributed load. So whenever you see distributed load, you want to find the beginning of the, the, the beginning, like the moment at the beginning of distributed load, which is in this case zero, the moment at the end of distributed load, which is zero, then make a dotted line between them. And in our case here, it's aligning with the beam. And from the middle, we wanna go up 
by WL square over eight, which is the magic number that I told you about, and then make the bending moment, okay? And you will see the disadvantage of this method in the next problem. So from the start and on the end, then make a, make a dotted line. So the steps is find the moment at the beginning and the end of the threaded load, okay? I found them. Second step, make a dotted line between them. I did. And from the middle of that dotted line, go up by WL square over 8. In our case, the dotted line is on the beam, which is at the zero. There is no moment here. Sorry, there is, I mean, like, I will tell you in the next example. It, it will make more sense. But here, I will go up by WL square over 8. So I went up from, like, a zero, right? That's why zero plus WL square over 8. So I have the WL square over 8 as a moment. It will make sense in the next problem. So in the next problem, at the beginning, I, do, I will start now from left to right, zero. And then at that point, it, is there, it, is, it, is, it makes sense to start from the left to right, right? It doesn't make sense to start from the right to left. So choose the side that will, it's easy to calculate and then do, do your calculation. So in the middle here, I do have this 16 will rotate clockwise around that point. That's why I will draw a small curve here. It's going to look up. So 16.5 times 2, which is 33. And the arrow here looks up, means it's positive bending moment. OK, at that point, I'll make two arrows, one for the 16.5 and the other one for the 5. I mean like two curves. 16.5 going to rotate up. Clockwise, 16.5 times 5. And then the 5 times 3 going to be down. 5 times 3 equals 15. And that one is 82.5. So the resultance of 82.5 rotating clockwise and 15 counterclockwise, as if you want to say 82.5 minus 15, and you're going to end up with equal to positive 65.7. So at that point, I'm going up to 65.7. Now I see distributed load. So what I want you to do is calculate the, the moment at the beginning of distributed load and at the end. So at the beginning, we already calculated, which is 67.5. At the end, since I don't see any concentrated load here, sorry, concentrated moment here, it's going to be zero. But in some cases where the beam continues, and the threaded load stops here, and, and they have other calculations here, you can still use this method and find the bending moment here, okay? Which is, let me do it, just for the sake of this example. Of course, it's, it's kind of obvious that we should start from right to left, but like, let me start from the le left to right. So I will do have 16.5, times the whole distance now, which is 10. And then I do have a curve like this, which is 5 times 8, 40. So this will be 165, and then I have 40. Then I do have the bending moment, so I will put it as a point load. 10 times 5 is 50. So the moment due to this distributed load is going to be, looking down, 50 times 2.5, which is 50 times this distance, which is 2.5, which is equal to 125. Now let's find the resultant. I do have a clockwise 165, then minus 40, minus 125, it is equal to 0. In this example, we already know before doing this calculation, it's going to be 0 because I don't see any concentrated moment here. But in the other examples where we do have a beam continues with other loads here and the, bending and the distributed load stopped here, we need to find the moment at the end of the distributed load. So now I found the, mo the moment at the end of the distributed load, which is zero. Make a dotted line between them. And from the middle, you need to find at the middle. So at the middle here, 
what is the value of the moment in the middle here, like as if we have a triangle here, what is the magnitude in the middle if we start from 67.5? So the middle here is 67.5 over 2, which is 33.75. So keep this number in your mind, and we're going to use it in a moment. And now tell me whether the, this, um, this bending moment is going to concave up or it's going to concave down. Now we're going to use the shortcut, which tells us if we have a load, distributed load that looks down, so the, the moment is going to concave down. That's why I will draw the bending moment concaves down like this. So let me find, okay, by how much it went up, and it's going to go up here by a value, which is WL squared over 8. And what is WL squared over 8? W is 10. L is the length, which is 5 squared over 8. So 10 times 5 squared over 8, that is 31 point two five so you want to go up by let me write it in red thirty one point two five right so going to thirty one by thirty one two five from where from the value that you calculated which is thirty three point seven five so what you want to do you want to say thirty three point seven five plus that value and you'll end up with that moment okay so in that case it's gonna be sixty five and that's your bending moment, which is 33.75 plus 31.25. And that's 65. And here comes this advantage of this point, of this, uh, this method, which, which this method cannot detect the maximum bending moment. If you remember from the previous method, which we drew the shear, we found the accurate maximum bending moment was 74.1, right? In this method, the other method, because we weren't able to draw the shear, we found this 65. In the exam, in the exam, I want you to draw the accurate one, okay? The shear and then find the accurate bending moment and the accurate maximum bending moment. But if you don't have, if you run out of time, or if you, for example, in the industry and you're working, you're gonna use that method for, because from 65 to 74, that's like a very small difference. And this difference is already covered, for example, in the, the factors of safety that we use in the design. But in the industry, when, we, when I say like in, in the practice you do it, you have software that will detect the maximum bending moment. But if you want to do for the sake of like running approximate calculation to find, for example, in our uh, specialization, if you want to find the reinforcement or anything, this can give you like approximate value. But like if you want to design it accurately, the software will get you the maximum bending moment. Okay. So again, if you do this in the exam, I'm going to deduct some point from you because you didn't get the maximum bending moment. Okay? And finally, this example, at the beginning, I do have zero. At the 50, I do have, I'll draw the curve first, that pointing that way because I'm working that way. I do have 20 times 10. It's going to rotate clockwise which is 200, and the arrow tells me which direction. So arrow looks up, so the moment is up. So I'll make the moment here, 200, positive. And then, and now I want to start from the right to left. So from right to left, I will draw the curve, which is that way. So they, they already did, did this for me. So I want to work that way. That's why I want to draw the curve that's warping toward that way, which is already the 100 is drawn that way. If the 100 were to draw on that way, because it still, it still like has the same effect, because the bending moment here, this green, so this blue is still clockwise. So if it was drawn that way, I will just adjust it towards the direction that I'm working at, which is what the example itself drew. So now the arrow looks down, so I want to draw the bending moment down, 100, and just I make a line between them. Okay, and that was all for that lesson, and thank you.